Hello everyone, it's DW here from Payble. Thank you very much for joining our webinar. Today we have some great content for you centering on the economy and what we can predict for the rest of the year. Before we do, you may not know what Payble is and who we are, but we're a payment experience platform for local government. Nerida, who will be joining us today, is the chief economist at Ray White. We never used to talk much about inflation because before the pandemic, it was pretty stable. It was always between, you know, around 2%. But then obviously the, the pandemic did lead to this incredible high level of inflation mm. and cutting across lots of product groups. You know, construction costs were a big one. It got became really expensive to build homes and, and renovate homes. Uh, fuel prices went up. We saw supply chain blockages, furniture, uh, food is a big one as well. Energy prices, which I mentioned earlier, it, it has just been a, a really tough time for households because, uh, if, you know, no matter if you're a retiree or you're a first home buyer, it's 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 really leading to this really challenging situation. The Reserve Bank want to keep. Uh, the inflation rate between two and three percent. So when it gets above three percent, uh, they need to increase rates because they need to slow down the economy. When it goes below 2%, they need to cut rates to try and speed up the economy. Since the Reserve Bank has been increasing rates, uh, the you can see there that inflation has come down. In, when interest rates are up, we're spending more on our mortgages, businesses are spending more on their debt, governments spending more on their debt holding on to their debt. So all of those things mean less money for other things. It does push down inflation. Inflation, I think, is sitting at around 3.4% on a monthly basis at the moment. So once it gets below 3%, uh, it will be a, a, a trigger, I guess, for, for the Reserve Bank to cut rates. You know, one of the best ways, I think, for most people to get, an, get a, an idea of where rates are heading is to, to head on to the ASX website, have a look at the RBA interest rate futures index. Um, and, and in that, you can actually see where people who are putting money on in terms of where they think rates are heading. The market is predicting a hold in May. So 10% um, chance of a cut. So it will probably be a hold. That same index is at, at the moment today is, is predicting a cut in around September, October. Uh, another one in February and then another one sort of mid next year. One thing I would also like to draw people's attention to is the monthly CPI indicator. Would you like to share uh, how this metric is different to the overall inflation number that we get? Inflation used to be re um, reported quarterly and it used to be reported quarterly because, you know, as I mentioned before, no one really was that worried about inflation because it, it really did stick in the, you know, general band of, of where, we, where we wanted it. Since Inflation started rising rapidly. The ABS decided to release their monthly consumer price index indicator. So this gives us a, a more um, more regular update on what's happening to, to inflation. So it is basically the same as the quarterly one, but it excludes some categories. In alignment with analysing the market futures, I also think that this is a really good thing to put a newsletter alert in your email inbox just so you're keeping an eye on things. The way that um, the, uh, the CPI tracks housing or housing costs is through two or two major measures. I guess the first one is rents and the second one is new dwelling purchases. So that new dwelling purchases is basically a, a proxy for con construction costs. And, um, and both of those have been increasing very, very rapidly. Um, electricity has as well. Um, I'm not, if not sure exactly. That must be the latest data. It has, it has mm. moderated quite a bit, but that, that's also been a, a big cost increase. But Maybe just talking about rents first. Um, it has been really challenging for renters. Um, Australia, prior to the pandemic, uh, did have one of the more the most affordable rental markets in the world, um, according to the OECD. Uh, the number of people under rental stress was actually quite low. Um, that's changed, obviously. We have seen a skyrocketing of rent. Clearly, there's a shortage of rental properties, and you know that's 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 a critical one. Housing is just going gangbusters. Yeah, look, it's, it's continuing to increase. I mean, it, last year was surprising um, because we did have those very strong increases in um, in, in interest rates. 
you know, it's not just all about interest rates. Um, it, it is also a lot to do with housing supply. We're not we're not that good at building. Um, Australia is, you know, we do underbuild relative to our, our population growth. We're also changing in time in terms of our our household types. There's more single person household households, so that that's changing the types of homes that that we need and which we don't have. So that that's also a challenge. But fundamentally, Australia is a very very expensive country to live in. There's a, a report that's put out by a group, group called Demo, Demographia, and in that in that report, Australia is is the second least affordable country in the world after Hong Kong. It's crazy to think about the level of mortgage stress as almost the same as the GFC times. Why is this still happening? How how come this isn't pushing down prices or leading to more home sales? To give you an idea of, of kind of the challenges that we're facing, when house price growth is strong, you know, we typically see premium markets do really well first and then and then it sort of follows that cheaper suburbs do a lot better. But what we're seeing this cycle is um, very quite affordable areas seeing very strong increases. And I think that fundamentally is being driven by high construction costs is very much more expensive than it was three years ago. So one of the big differences between this cycle and, and the GFC is that banks are being very accommodating. If people are under mortgage stress, they are working very closely to try and help them. And um, they're doing things like putting people on long, longer le- loan terms. They're um, putting them on interest only. Um, they're helping them consolidate debt. And that wasn't possible in the GFC. In the GFC, there was no money to, for, to help people. But at the moment, because banks are so profitable, they are able to help people uh, a lot more than they, they were in, in the last time, the last time that we did see such significant levels of mortgage stress. The Middle East conflict is, is um, you know, probably a net negative to, to what's happening in Australia, primarily because it does block up supply chains. Um, but we are far less impacted than than Europe. There is a US election. I think everyone's, you know, pretty across the fact that, um, you know, we, we could see Trump re-elected. Um, probably the biggest challenge for us with a, with a Trump um, a, um, as leader is that he does have the uh, or he does have a track record of overheating the US economy. So um, that will have the potential for, you know, a lot of things. An overheated economy, you know, does lead to perhaps better demand for some of our goods and services, but then it also has impact on the US dollar. If, if that goes really, if that's super strong, it means our, our dollar is very weak. If our dollar's weaker and rising fuel charges, it could be a little bit of upwards pressure on inflation. Sorry to tell everyone about that. You know, you're absolutely right. Weak dollar is, is not great for inflation. So it's it does mean that anything we buy from overseas becomes far more expensive. Councils are under the same cost pressures as everyone else. So it is much more expensive to hire people. Um, energy costs are more expensive. Um, I think one of the things with increasing rates is it does impact households, so that obviously feeds into inflation as well. But one of the positives is that it will potentially lead to fewer vacant homes in Australia and fewer vacant properties. You can see the challenges that councils are, are facing at the moment, and um, obviously rates is the main form of income. So it, it does it does make sense for them to to be looking closely at how much they're charging to ratepayers. Ultimately, the answer is a case by case basis, and there are a lot of councils that have more of a propensity to absorb some of this, and I believe that they can exercise that position. But for a lot of others, they're struggling to pay contractors and fulfil their obligations. Now, did you think you have any closing uh, comments or thoughts? This year is, is looking a lot more positive, and um, particularly if we do start to see inflation edge below 3% and interest rates are cut, I think that will provide a lot of relief. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, we, we do have a lot to look forward to. Before we go, are we able to get your final prediction for this year or would you rather would you rather <laughs> sit with, you know, a more balanced, you know, there's a few factors going on kind of approach? Know, yeah, the rate cut one, I don't know. Starting to get, you know, the, the push out of when, we, when we'll potentially see a rate cut is getting pushed out. But for now, I'll, I'll say yes, we will see a rate cut, but it, it probably won't be till quite late in the year.